What's up, disciples? It is the final episode of season three, so it's kind of bittersweet. I'll tell you more about what's coming at the end of the show for future seasons. But for now, we've got a great episode for you. We've got three people coming in today, Matt Gonzalez, Janine Bowling, and Josh Salzberg. This podcast, The Red Letter Disciple, exists to challenge you wherever you are to be a greater disciple of Jesus, believing that when we are the greatest disciples that we can be, of course, by God's grace and through the power of His Holy Spirit, we're going to show the world who the real Jesus is, and that's what's going to change the world. And so these three come on to the show today. We have a great conversation about fighting racism and why it's important for us, why racism racism, fighting against racism is discipleship. You're going to learn some practical next steps. And if you're like me, I'm a middle-aged white dude and haven't always known my place when it comes to fighting racism. And so today's conversation was helpful for me as I continue to learn my place in this. And I think you're going to help learn your place too. So that's what's coming today. You're going to, it's, it's going to be awesome just a couple minutes from now. First though, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Red Letter Living. We are a company that creates resources that challenges people of all ages to follow Jesus. This podcast is one of them. We also have a free Red Letter Challenge assessment that we would love for you to take 40 questions about t- seven to 10 minutes. This is for the everyday disciple of Jesus. And here's what's going to happen. After you take this assessment, it's going to measure you according to the five targets that we believe were the most prominent out of the mouth of Jesus for followers of Jesus to hit. Be, forgive, serve, give, and go. So how are you doing as a disciple of Jesus? We talk a lot about today, fighting racism is discipleship. And so how are you truly living as a disciple today? The Red Letter Challenge Assessment is going to help you. It is free on our website. Go to redletterassessment.com. You'll find the link to take that assessment to get some real practical next steps and to see where you are today. And that is our gift to you. All right. Episode 10 is just a second away from now. But before we get there, if this season has been fun for you, if it's challenged you, if it's been helpful for you, tell a friend, hashtag Red Letter Disciple, do it on social media as well, and rate and review our podcast. My co-host, Chris Johnson, isn't able to join us today. He is uh, at a memorial service for a spiritual mentor of his and mine. And so God bless you, Chris, at that. Uh, We've got three great guests coming on the show, and I'll tell you more about what's coming in season four after the show. But for now, Episode 10 of Season 3 of The Red Letter Disciple. Let's do this. All right, this is going to be a fun episode of The Red Letter Disciple and also really helpful. Today, I've got the co-founders and leaders of Lutherans for Racial Justice, LRJ, with us. Pastor Matt Gonzalez and Josh Salzberg are joining the show today. Matt is a pastor in the Bronx up in New York, and Josh is a screenwriter and film editor in California. So we got Coast to Coast covered with these two. Also, we have Deaconess Janine Bowling joining us as well in the Bronx, and she is the co-host of the Impartial Church podcast and now a member of the LRJ team. And so welcome to Matt, Janine, and Josh. It is great to have you on the Red Letter Disciple podcast today. Thanks so much for having us, Zach. Yeah. So here's the first question I have. I know all three of you are in it now, but I believe that LRJ was founded by you, uh, Josh and Matt. And so I got to know, how does a Puerto Rican based pastor in New New York and a white screenwriter from California team up to do something together? Well, my my wife actually just reminded me of this recently. She she was leading a youth event uh, out on the East Coast and uh, six and Matt met Matt uh, through that. And uh, I think it was like six months later, uh, Matt, you can remind me we had I I had a movie in the Tribeca Film Festival in New York. And I don't really remember how it happened, but we floated the idea uh, that we were coming out. And I'm pretty sure Matt said, stop everything. You're staying with my family. Uh, we're going to babysit your newborn, go have fun at the film festival. And uh, so, yeah, we kept in touch after that and talked about, um, you know, race and the church. But it was really uh, in 2020 after the murder of George Floyd that Matt had posted a video uh, speaking very clearly and compassionately about the protests in a time, you know, where a lot of church leaders uh either were silent or were finger wagging or whatever. And that video kind of blew up in our uh, church world and gave me some hope that maybe it was possible to spark more of these conversations in our church body and, you know, kind of spark change in our own backyard, so to speak. 
Yeah, that's really amazing. And I, I think, yeah, I'm, I'm with you that it felt like in the, the wake of the George Floyd incident, lots of pastors or churches, many of them said something, and, and I'm grateful for that. It was the right time to do that. But but many of them then just went back to church as normal. And so I'm, I'm really grateful that out of that um, came Lutherans for Racial Justice, which was a, a movement that wasn't just going to say something once or post one video that, that may have went a lot of places, but but is going to be doing the the day-to-day work and the groundwork uh, to, to make this more of a conversation and bring healing and reconciliation into this issue. So Janine, I'd love to know then how you got to be a part of Lutherans for Racial Justice. Um, I've been a part of Lutherans for Racial Justice all my life. We just never had a name. <laughs> Good point. Good point. Yeah. Amen, girl. Amen. That's pretty much. Um, but obviously, like uh, Matt and I are colleagues in New York and, and friends. And, and when this came up, uh, I saw the video. Um, I, I thought it was a great response to everything that was going on and, and kind of got really at the emotion um, that a lot of people of color were feeling and not being validated for. And so um, I think it was maybe like a month after that, not even, um, before we all got together on a on a call on a Zoom like this and, and talked it through. So it's always been a heart issue of mine and one that I connected with my faith. And, and then I'm just really glad that the larger church is doing it now, too. That's awesome. So tell me, Matt, both of them referenced a video. I think they said you were in it. Tell me, tell me what this video is and then what Lutherans for Racial Justice is. Sure. Um, so the video was essentially, uh, it was actually a, a response that I really wrote to my congregation. I mean, we're in the midst of COVID. So, you know, everybody's making videos. That was the cool thing to do. But, um, you know, it, it's something that for me, you know, Janine put it really well, right? Like being a Lutheran for racial justice is a lifelong thing, right? As a person of color. And I think, um, you know, it was uh, something that we've talked about at our congregation for a long time in, in, in the Bronx. And I just felt like it needed to be said to not just our congregation, but it, I needed people from our congregation to know that we were going to be vocal and bold about talking about these issues uh, in every way, because that's what Christians need to do. And um, recognizing that, I, I, I just created a video um, called Dear Church, It's Time to really respond to um, a lot of the way that people were talking about the civic conversation, but also the way people were talking about um, what we were seeing in the everyday world and then how the church needed to be honest and open about uh, ways that we've been complicit, ways that we've been silent, ways that we haven't uh, addressed it, and then ways that we need to be serious about it and recognize it as a real serious issue. Um, And to Janine's credit, you know, Josh and I get a lot of uh, uh, credit for being the founders. I think the better way to kind of credit us is as the faces, um, because I opened my mouth and then Josh was like, I want to open my mouth and and this kind of thing. But, you know, Janine is somebody who has always been vocal about it, um, especially as long as I've known her. And so she was here from its inception. We just were kind of, uh, I guess, a little more out there on the on the front end. But, you know, she's also super involved and and uh, really, um, you know, a really important voice for us because, you know, I'm Puerto Rican, Josh is white, um, you know, and both male. And Janine um, really helps fill what I would say are two, two really important um, parts of this, which are one, that she's not only a person of color, but a, a black American. And then the other piece of it is that she's a female. So it gives really two, two important voices that um, help to, 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 for us to learn, you know, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, I'm sure. But I think uh, an important thing to say is that if your posture is in humility and learning, especially with this issue, that's the first problem. So that's good. And if you guys can't tell, I'm a middle-aged white man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're wondering. Um, and so, okay. So you put out this video, Matt, and I'm sure everybody received it super well, right? Of course, of course. It was. <laughs> Tell me know, reactions. You know, um, we've had. I mean, I had a ton of reactions from a spectrum perspective. I had a lot of people really supportive. I was actually really encouraged by how many people were supportive, how many people were excited, how many people were thankful. Um, and I kept trying to say, you know, don't thank me. And it's not about me, right? It's about Jesus and and the faith that he's gifted to me. And the spirit led me to, I mean, honestly, it was one of these things where like the Holy Spirit really like was like lit the fire and was drumming on my heart. Like, you got to do this. You got to say this. So I can't even sit here and act like I did anything great. Um, And so I was really excited about that. 
we also had people who were uh, who were not as pleased for whatever reason, um, and I have my thoughts on that uh, from a more specific standpoint. And maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that. But ultimately, you know, they they shared that they thought it was taking the focus off of Jesus or these kinds of things, and and maybe also had some political leanings for whatever reason, one side or the other, that they felt, you know, almost like why bring God into this issue? Um, And for me, it was more of this is a faith issue, right? Like if we are not, uh, I mean, I always say it's a Philippians issue, right? You know, uh, do uh, um, regard others more highly than yourself, right? You know, um, and and it's a Philippians 2 issue. And so if we're not considering that a real thing, it's a problem. And so, um, you know, that's really where I take it. But yeah, we had a lot. I mean, I had, we had some wild voicemails that we received, all kinds of stuff. So it was, well, it was yeah, the, the, those threats were fun. I, I got to make a Nebraska, I got to make a Nebraska connection though. After Matt's video, we, we launched Lutherans for Racial Justice uh, with a video that uh, cut together clips from a documentary uh, from the 60s uh, during the civil rights movement that was made actually about a Lutheran church in Omaha, Nebraska. Mm. That was uh, a white church uh, deciding if they were going to try and reach out to a black church in the neighborhood and maybe have like a dinner together or something like that. And it it, it blew up the church and created a whole wow. controversy. And uh, so we we launched with clips from that video and it was wild how relevant uh things that were being said uh in the early 60s you know felt uh to today and i want to shameless plug it uh because you can watch it on youtube for free it's called the time for burning and any christian i would encourage you to watch it for two reasons one because it's i mean you learn a ton from it just sitting there listening but two i would always challenge people to to consider as they watch it um how much do they feel like they that could be a church today because I think good. that was something that I really like just resonated in my heart yeah. and mind when I was watching it. So, and we'll put that link in the show notes too. Is, is your video, Matt, also uh, the dear, dear church. It's time. I think is what you labeled it. Is that also still, we can find yep. that and put that. Okay. You can we'll find put... it. It is up <laughs> <laughs> on, on YouTube as well. And we have a, we, YouTube, have a but... uh, we have a free discussion guide as well for a time for burning that I think is a really, really helpful resource that Janine and, and a couple of other educators put together uh it's worth checking out too not to plug uh yeah. plug our stuff so early no, that's great that's i mean that's part of what this is 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 I, I want it to be educational especially for people that look like me uh because i, I found in my own story is i'm aware i've always been aware that racism is a problem uh, but I had a very shallow understanding of that until I intentionally myself, um, through a, a voice of another pastor who was my age, started to find and 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 put my eyes on things that I hadn't put my eyes on before, and and went and I've been on this journey of discovery and learning for seven eight years. I, I'm nowhere near where I want to be or need to be, but I'm on this journey of discovery, and and that's where I, I do feel like, with as much as God has done for me, I, I want to use this platform to bring people who are doing things that I think are moving the needle to be more like Jesus. And that's what I cannot figure out for the life of me, how anyone can think about justice issues and specifically racism. And, and like you said, the Philippians two part of it and see that, that this is not like the podcast is called red letter disciple fighting racism is discipleship. It's the same thing. It's not one in the other. And so this is, are there other causes to discipleship? Sure. Are there other things? Yes but this is part of it. And so I'm really passionate about that. And I don't mind you sharing the reason we're going to share them that that's what this is for. And so I want to ask uh, anyone can answer this because uh, Lutherans for racial justice, right? It's a grassroots uh, coalition for specifically for our denomination, Lutheran church, Missouri synod that I- I'm a part of, and I have been, but whether or not you're Lutheran like this, I think you're going to learn a lot of great things from this. And so there are more than just Lutheran that watch this, but I think I've heard the LCMS, correct me if I'm wrong, is the widest denomination in America, maybe even surpassing the Mormon church, which, you know, obviously there's some issues there too. Uh, Is that right? Or where are we at today? And why are we in this place where we're even talking about being the whitest? Because I don't feel like that's a good thing to win. (laughs) Uh, why not i don't think we're (laughs) i don't think we're at the top of that list uh you're right about uh you know i think uh you know mormons are like 86 percent white or something like that we might be tied for up with other groups but 95 is pretty 
95, 96. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The, the big thing there is you can like focus on the numbers and and obviously like it's not a healthy thing to go like, well, what is the right percentage of people of color to attract to our white church? But like that's not necessarily the healthiest thing either to think of it as quotas and whatever. But, you know, for me, at least the, the way we talk about it is like knowing that and knowing that we also have the largest Protestant school system in the country and our students are increasingly diverse in our schools mm. uh, and much more diverse, obviously, than our church body, but also our leadership and our faculty at many of our schools. And with that in mind, and and including also the, the communities we serve are very diverse in terms of where our congregations are at. With all of that in mind, um, the awareness, the education that's needed, that's really what it's about, is, is not so much of like, how can we hit a quota, but to know that that's where we're at and yet the communities we serve, we maybe have a cultural gap that we're not understanding. And that points out the need that there is for more cultural awareness. That's good. Maybe Janine, I'd love for your answer on this because I, I heard Matt say that the church has been silent or the church has even been complicit in this, which is something that documentary that you referenced hits at. And, and I just don't think there's a, quite an awareness of that for most people. And so I think of like Jamar Tisby's book, The Color of Compromise, and going through just story after story after story of how like the church has not only not been silent, but it, yeah, it's been complicit in this. And so can you kind of help us understand, because I think we are where we are for a reason. And, and I think part of that is our church history in America. So what, what would you say to that? I think that that definitely plays a role in it. Um, when we look at things like those percentages, we also have to think about how things are designed and if we don't have some fault in the way that um, things are structured. So when we think about the church body, what the, and we're talking about discipleship, what does it look like to bring people in? What, is, what does outreach look like? What does in-reach look like? What is uh, the continued pursuance of people who maybe are different than us, regardless of how uncomfortable it might be? I think that's really where the breakdowns happen. Um, so not necessarily that um, we're pursuing a number similar to what Josh was saying, but really more that the way that things have always been or our lock-in with certain traditions may be a, a barrier um, for, for people of color in our community who are there, available, can clearly get to our space, clearly pass it every day in their everyday lives, um, but are not a part of that larger family of God in terms of membership, right? And so um, that's where we're called to have that introspection where we look at ourselves and see if there's anything that we're missing or if there's anything that we're doing that's contributing to it. And that's where listening to the voices of um, people who are already connected to us who represent those backgrounds is really important. And that's the time is now in the church for um, listening to those voices. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. And you asked, you asked how we got here. And, and I'll only like touch on this because I think it is it's specific to our church body, but I think it's universal because everybody ha has these stories, no matter what faith background you're coming from. You know, that the, the first president of the LCMS was against abolition. So that's where we're starting. Um, and the reasons he gave were fear of communism and feminism. Uh, things you might hear, hear today. So age old story. That's where we started with abolition. You can go to the civil rights movement, um, you know, and and even before that, you know, how uh, education and, and the pastoral system was set up within our church body um, and how segregation, you know, impacted that. And we have some of the history on our website if you want to get into it, um, you know, to present day where we can look at economic barriers. You know, if you want to uh, pack up and move your family across the country and go to seminary. Um, you know, there's a financial barrier there to housing, taking a call at a church, you know, in a city or in an expensive area is difficult. So there's there's a lot, a lot of those barriers that have kind of got us to where we are today, including things like worship style that we argue over or other other maybe cultural barriers uh, that end up impacting demographics as well. Yeah, no, that's that's helpful to get there. And what I liked about Janine, just as context. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, we need that context. And, and, and we are where we are for a reason, for many reasons, for many decisions, for many things. And I, I heard Janine talk about that 
uh, you know, no matter what what's going on with the church, like it's going to take us as individuals now. And, and so this is a podcast designed for disciples, the everyday disciple. And and so I would say no matter what like your church is doing and what others are doing, like all of us have a role and a responsibility uh, with what God has given to us, this beautiful gift of grace to to take this out into the world. And and like I'm really saddened, truth truth be told, by the collective church's overall response to racial reconciliation. Uh, especially in light of 2020. And I, I know there was a lot of other things happening that year. And so I uh, try to give grace, but it, it's difficult. You know, after we experienced uh, George Floyd, right before that was Ahmaud Arbery and, and Breonna Taylor and Jacob Blake, boom, 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 boom all of these things. Uh, Barna, who's, you guys know, one of the greatest research, they are the the probably the strongest research company in our nation when it comes to Christianity, um, they 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 did some studies in 2020, and what what saddens me is that among self-identified Christians, so people that say I, I believe in Jesus, that He died, rose, and 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 He's coming back, and you know that that people who say they believe in Him, that prior to 2020 and night in 2019, there were only uh, 19% of self-identified Christians that were unmotivated or not at all motivated to help fight against racism. And then in 2020, with all of those things happening, you would think the number would be lower, but it actually went up from 19% to 30%, a 10% increase in people that say, I believe in Jesus, but I'm no longer motivated or not at all motivated to help in, in, in the cause of fighting against racism. So the more we see it, the more we see this injustice collectively, the less compelled we are to act. And I can't figure that out. What do I make of this? So I, uh, oh, go ahead, Janine. I have, I have something that um, we actually dig into this in, in the second season, which is coming out soon on the Impartial Church podcast. Um, but one of, the, one of the things I noticed just as an individual when you talk with people about it is that there's a disagreement on what the problem is. So sometimes when you ask somebody, you know, are you interested in, in fighting against racial just uh, or in, in working towards racial reconciliation, right? They don't know what you mean with the problem piece of it. So what is the problem with race in America? Well, we have laws that exist that have pretty much taken care of those problems. So they, but there are people who exist who don't know what the problem is now. They may be playing oblivious. They may be genuinely not understanding it, but I know that's a big one. Then you get the second layer, which is like the generational differences. So generation um, Gen Z, which is um, the context, like I know Matt and I work in um, with high school and, and, and obviously you were, you know, you were a leader at the National Youth Gathering. So their generation is one of the, is the most diverse generation of all time so far. However, the generation right behind them, the millennials were the largest living generation and we're the ones in the workforce. And then there's a completely different generation who's making all of the, the laws and the decisions. And so when you have so many different generational cohorts working together, but their point of view on what the problem is, is, is so different, I think they end up talking, I won't even say like talk past each other. It's it's where it is now with the percentages where I'm not interested in even talking about it because I know you don't see the problem the same way I do. So how can we see the solution the same way? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. What, what were you going to say? No. So everything Janine just said, I second that. And actually she said it in a much better way than me. So <laughs> I'm glad I, I didn't say anything first, but the other thing I was going to say is I, I think of it also, you know, um, it's funny. A lot of people like to deflect the issue of racism by just saying it's a sin problem. Right. Mm -hmm. And I agree with you. Racism is a sin and it is a sin problem. I actually think using that like thinking that way helps us to kind of answer the question you asked, because what we like to do with sin is um, essentially deflect it, right? So if it's not affecting me, well, then it's not that it's not a bad sin, right? You know, or or we go the other way and it's like it's the most heinous sin, um, but I don't do it. Right. So, well, you know, I'm not one who has ever participated in that sin. The people who do are horrible. But why, what do I need to fight about? It's not even that real. It's not even that big of a deal, these kinds of things, or, or it doesn't involve me, right? And so we do that, um, 
you know, we, I, we could go over our own personal sins and figure out where it fits. But ultimately, we do that a lot with racism, right? Like, oh, I've never been racist. So why would I have to have anything to do with this? Be and almost like we're saying, if I have to deal with this, well, then I'm accepting some sort of, you know, uh, uh, role in it. And I think what we, again, and I said this before, I think we got to go back to being humble to say, there's probably things I don't even realize, right? And it's funny, we say it, you know, when, when we talk about sin, we're like, oh man, I probably have hurt people I didn't even realize, you know, uh, um, you know, I, I've, I confess to the sins I don't remember, these kinds of things. So we're quick to do those kinds of things. But then when it's like, yeah, this is one of those, it's like, well, not that, I, I don't do that, you know? And it's like, mm, that's probably part of the problem too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that if if we're feeling that way, like, oh, it's not, you know, it's not my issue. It's not my responsibility. I'm good. It's easy for us to just look a, a, another a, another direction. And yet when we look at Jesus and his example, it, it's not even about, uh, you know, what got you. But he, he would he would continually and constantly go to those who were underappreciated, overlooked, forgotten, cast aside. And so that's my plea for disciples is even if you don't feel like it's your issue or you're not complicit in it, like there are still people that are hurting. And, and so the worst thing we could do is turn a blind eye towards something like this. And every time, like I've talked about racial reconciliation, it, 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 it creates really strong emotions <laughs> in others, people. And, and I'll admit, like I've, as I'm growing in my own understanding and voice, like I, I wouldn't necessarily say that all the ways I've postured the conversation in the past have been the most helpful. Um, but I am curious, like, what, have you gotten pushback from anyone regarding what you're doing, Lutherans for Racial Justice? And like, what are the common pushbacks that, that you experience? One is that it's situational. So the experiences I've found when people of color talk about their experiences in the church, um, people often write it off as situational. That happened one time at this one church in Ohio. How many times has it really happened to you in your life? So even almost sometimes when you're explaining where the hurt or where the, uh, the missteps were, people write it off as um, just a one-time thing or a seldom, um, a seldom experience, life experience, which discounts a part of the humanness of the person. And then also when we think about bearing one another's burden and fulfilling the law of Christ, it also um, tells me as an individual that you're not interested in hearing about my burdens because they trigger you for whatever reason. So it's like a, mm -hmm. almost like a selfishness in the listening posture mm -hmm. when it comes to talking about experiences that have happened, whether that be in a school context, in a church context. Um, I know I've been denied like communion several times at the rail, I think because of skin color, um, but people have argued with me directly about how it's not that. Um, so like just some of those things when people are explaining life experiences, uh, writing them off often can stop the conversation cold. So situational that it happened once or twice here and it may or may not have even been your skin color. Who knows? We weren't there. Dismiss right. it. Right. So when people right. are, are being really inquisitive about, well, when has this happened or like what's going on? Right. That's a, that happens a lot with LRJ, whether it's um, within like like comments on social media or even conversations. Um that will come up and, and people will uh, discount those experiences by asking about the quantity of them rather than understanding that the, the quality or the very instance of them has shaped somebody's faith in, an, in a negative way that then has to be worked out with God and, and worked out with the church. That's good. What would you guys add, Matt and Josh? Yeah. Uh, Anti-white racism is another thing that, that we get accused of if you're going to talk about uh, you know, racial justice, racism, just anything around cultural context. Uh, the the end game, you know, we're accused of is that we're trying to persecute uh, white people. I, I do think it's worth, I think there's some confusion. Janine talked about generations talking past each other, or even cultures talking past each other. I, I, I think one thing that gets confused is that there is, it's like we have an issue with a specific white person uh, and, and, and that's the issue and we're going to target them and bring them down or, or a group of them or whatever it is. It, it is the idea of white supremacy though, and whiteness. And that's something that we have to name and talk about meaning uh, that as uh, a white person believing, first of all, that that's a real thing. Um, I'm 
you know, I am I am white because that's a cultural marker we have, and I've been ra racialized in that way, and I've identified with it, and 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 we can talk about that. But you know, I'm I'm half Jewish, and I'm uh, Scottish and Welsh, and you know, that's my heritage. Um, and I didn't grow up with that. I didn't grow up with a sense of that. Um, that's something that whiteness took for me was that specificity. Um, and and so that's what we're talking about when we talk about you know, white supremacy is the idea that because I am lumped in with whiteness, which of course changes all the time, you know, Italian American immigrants were not white. In fact, Sicilians, darker skinned Italians were lynched um, in a way that we've kind of erased from history um, there and now are seen as white. The the idea that I'm lumped in with white and I see myself better than that's white supremacy. And, and that's the issue, not uh, a white person, not a group of white people. It's it's that idea that is really the issue. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to touch on one other thing. Um, well, two things I want to, so quick, super quick story. So one of the things Josh, you know, just described, I think is something that I experienced from a different perspective. Um, you know, my wife is, um, she's, she says she's, you know, uh, a, a mutt in, in a different way, but, you know, German, um, English, French, um, she's got a number of different, you know, cultural markers in her family history. And when, you know, I would tease her, you know, just goofing around and I was like, ah, but you're just white, you know? And, but then being in New York, like as a New Yorker, being Italian is a thing, right? Like that's a marker of like a group of people um, being Irish. Like those are specific cultural markers, especially when that was something that was big, um, you know, through Ellis Island and these kinds of things. And so, when I would kind of talk with Katie about that, she'd be like, you can't do it both ways, you know? And it was helpful for me to understand like, yeah, even when we think of, you know, kind of how history has been whitewashed and people take that and say like, oh, whitewash is against white people. It's like, no, it's just been washed away. It's been problematically washed away. That's really what whitewashed means. Um, one, of the, one, of my, one of the resources that I love is um, uh, urban, uh, urban apology, uh, urban Christianity. I think that's what it's called, right? By uh, Dr. Eric Mason. And there's so much richness in that. And he talks about the, the term whitewashing and says, people think it has something to do with being white and it's not, it's how we just wash everything over and then just look at it one way. And I just think that's so helpful. The other thing I was going to say that, that we've gotten a lot of feedback or negative feedback and the like is that people are consistently saying, Oh, you're turning a political issue and making it an issue that has to do something with faith. And I'm like, mm -hmm. actually, it's quite the opposite. We're taking an issue that we should be addressing from a perspective of faith, where we actually have an authoritative voice, right? The voice of God speaks about things like justice and reconciliation and love and kindness and care. And you know, you, got, you go fruits of the spirit here, right? You could talk about all that stuff and say, God has given us and equipped us with really great tools to have these conversations. And instead, we've decided to turn it into some sort of political marker for who you might support, right? And it's so frustrating to me because I'm like, no, if we as Christians were really honest about um, the fact that God has equipped us with these things, we can bring that into the conversation so that it doesn't get watered down by kind of oh political jargon and the like but instead we say no we understand things like love and grace and mercy and peace and kindness and and care and humility and brokenness and all this stuff and we actually have a really really clear uh, um, voice that god has gifted to us by a spirit to talk about this stuff um, and we need to bring it into the spheres where people don't want to use that, right? Because that's where we can actually learn and grow instead of saying, oh, don't bring it into the church. It's like, no, it's here. It's been here. But if we talk about it honestly and faithfully, we can bring it into other areas of our life like we should be doing uh, as disciples, right? Like, I mean, that's the thing, right? So I think that's how we have to handle it. Yeah, and that's not that wasn't your question, but I got there. You know, no, that's good. <laughs> I want to I want to press a little more into that because that's what I, I'm struggling. Because technically, and again, you wouldn't be able to tell this by what what's out there in the media. Even last year, statistically, 63 percent of Americans still self-identify as Christian. So we still are far and away the religious majority. And, and obviously, I think we can all attest to like, I don't know if people really know what that means anymore to be Christian, because if, if we really have that much 
percentage of people that still identify with Jesus as their savior, then I struggle to find out. <laughs> I understand why they can say there's some politics in it, but I struggle that people would jump that it's primarily a po political issue and not a, a discipleship or a, Christ a faith issue. Why, why do we put politics before faith with this when Christ and God is so crystal clear on, on some of these issues? Well, we're products of our culture, first of all. And, and that's true. I mean, you know, we're on a podcast talking about discipleship and stuff. Uh, it, it's true when it comes to, you know, your churches and your demographics and stuff like that. It, it, you know, some of these things aren't <laughs> just spiritual issues. They're like clean cultural issues. And you can explain the history of your church if you get into the history of your, your community and your culture. But historically, you know, the largest movements of the Ku Klux Klan have been as a reaction to racial progress happening during Reconstruction in the 20s with the industrialization boom and immigration boom in the civil right after the civil rights movement. And of course, we're seeing uh, things now after 2020 and George Floyd. So those things aren't surprises. And I think you know, you're talking about why do we see this from a, a, a political point of view? There is a sense of self-preservation, um, you know, that comes along with all of this. And and that's where we get into the spiritual side of it. That's a story as old as time, you know, in terms of just looking at Abraham and Sarah, who took their Egyptian slave <laughs> Uh, took advantage of her to get a son because they didn't weren't trusting in the promises that they had. And then because Sarah was afraid that someone else's son would take the inheritance her son deserved, cast her out into the desert to die. Mm. That's the tradition that we start with, um, you know, uh, in, uh, that we're coming from. But that's a self-preservation thing. It's a very human thing to want to do that. And, and I think that's what we're wrestling with and why it gets into politics, uh, because we're trying to preserve our own culture, our own people, our own family. Well, and I also think that it, it's, it's driven by fear. Right. Like yeah. who, now, what is the fear? Sometimes people don't know. Sometimes people know clearly. Sometimes people will talk about it. Sometimes people won't talk about it. But deep down, they are wrestling with it. Um, but it's it's driven by fear where it's, you know, um, fear of of loss, I think, is one of the biggest things. Right. And when I say loss, what I mean is loss of, you know, well, what we're used to things a certain way or a certain expectation about things. And this is going to challenge that this is going to, you know, having the conversation is going to, and it's fear of, I would argue it's fear of, of dealing with truth, right. Which is a very Christian uh, or, or I should say a very human thing to do, right. Like Jesus calls us to, to wrestle with the truth and, and speak the truth and, and trust in him as the truth. But as sinners, our human nature says, um, yeah, OK, well, let me see how I can finagle this at every moment. Right. Like, let me twist it a little or shape it a little, because ultimately I want it to fit what is beneficial to me. And it's funny, Josh talks about being a cultural issue. Well, we see that in culture today where it's, hey, my truth. Right. Rather than the truth. And we think about how people are quick to, um, you know, lean on that because it's comfortable. And I think that's the real thing. Right. It's a place of fear because when we try to address fear, um, especially when we try to do it from a human perspective, we have to be uncomfortable and that bothers us. But I think the beauty is that that's where you go back to what we know. And this is where faith just jumps in as a beautiful, bold answer because we have the comforter, right? We have the one who actually can be a source of comfort where we recognize, man, I've been messing up. We have the one who offers ultimate forgiveness, who says, you've been messing up, here's grace, here's mercy. And so then we can take those gifts and actually say, wow, you know, I almost, it's like you can hear Jesus saying, now go and sin no more. You don't have to keep staying in this pattern where you recognize there's been wrongdoing. Instead, don't let fear be your God, right? Um, you know, and to me, it's First John 4, right? You know, uh, we think about how there's no fear in love. And that's real, you know, and then we know what love looks like because we love because he first loved us. Like there's so much richness in what we believe and then sharing that and with this issue. And it just, it, 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 oh, it grates at me when I'm like, why are people <laughs> thinking that this isn't a, a faith issue? And why wouldn't we want to share 
these great gifts we have to breathe into this issue because then we can actually talk about it and then recognize where we failed, right? Where we haven't said, hey, how come I'm not listening to this person rather than trying to tell them what to do, right? Assimilation versus integration. Um, how come I'm not trying to learn something rather than thinking I know more, right? When we think kind of pride versus humility, like these are all things that are foundational problems to the issue, but we want to stick to the problems. And that to me is a huge part of part of the problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what I heard in both of you is, uh, yeah, this self-preservation, fear of discomfort. Like it's all about all of our, uh, I would say, the causes for why we wouldn't get involved in this have to deal with self. <laughs> it's, yep. it's when we look at ourself, uh, it, 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 it would be reasons for us not to get involved. But when we look at the gospel, when we look at what God did for us, it's not about self-preservation or, or fear of not being uh, of, of discomfort, but it's rather expending ourselves and sacrificing. And, and guess what? When we solve injustice, it does have a cost. It, it will cost you something and, and it. And that's okay. That's the gospel. That's the, that's what he puts us here to do. Can we, so I, I, I think, I hope people here, Yes, we're called to be a part of this. Can we back up just a sec and say, like, why? Why, why does this matter for us to get this right in this world right now? What, what would you say to that? What, why? Outside of, like, because we're supposed to. <laughs> I, I would say, I mean, probably the bold answer that people really wouldn't want to hear um, from an American perspective as a Black American is because our forefathers haven't adequately mitigated the problem long-term, right? So caused long-term damages and didn't provide long-term solutions for it. So that's one big one just from a, um, a citizenship, you know? So I think of being a good citizen and, and, you know, raising and helping to raise young people and doing that, that's something that we're always thinking about. From a Christian perspective, we don't want to be out of alignment with God. Um, so we want to, like I've talked about before, that verse is really close to me, bearing one bearing one another's burdens, because even when someone's going through a difficult time, um, offering uh, empathy, sympathy, those are two things that we always do. But as Christians, walking with one another through the pit and, and understanding what that means, um, you know, in, in a heaven, in a heavenly sort of way is one thing, but we pray for God's kingdom um, and God's will to be done on earth each and every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. And so we forget what our roles are in that. And I think that it will help us to um, to have that closeness um, with, with God that, that he, he promises us so often in scripture to be loving God's people in the way that um, he sees them and knows them and understands them. That will take us longer to do, but we certainly can't say we don't have any time to do it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, super short answer. And I know it kind of mimics what you said not to say, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Um, for me, it's, 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 it's God's will, right? Like God's will is for us to be servant hearted in everything we do, and to trust in his word, and then to live that out, right until the day that he calls us to his kingdom to rest or until the day we're in the new creation, right? Like that's what God calls us to. It's, 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 it's it, you know, we over, we over comp, uh, complicate it often, but it's God is very clear in his word. And so to me, this is a part of that, right? We see something that's wrong and we have to be honest about it. And, 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 and then put ourselves to say, this is who God calls us to be, that we address it, that we say where it's problematic. And I think living in the United States, right? Being an American, we've been equipped to deal with it in, 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 in different ways. I would also say that we need to be bold in saying that being an American cannot ever over uh, supersede being Christian. Like we have to be real about that. When we fall into these patterns of, of being too um, um, impassioned about being our nation, like as Americans, rather than saying like, we believe in the God who said that around the throne are gonna be every tongue, tribe, people, and language, like every nation, right? We have to be more honest about that and say, so if your faith is aligning with some sort of political party or anything in the political sphere, that's a problem. It should not be aligning. If anything, your faith should be really intentional in how you enter the political sphere to say, hey, where there's right, 
we see right. Where there's wrong, we see wrong. And God has equipped us with that in his word um, uh, and with the things he's done to then say that in those spaces. And we don't have to be afraid of it because we don't have to look to any additional authority. Right? Like that's sometimes the problem too. It's like, well, what's the authority in this? It's like, what are you talking about? We have a God who has established himself in such an incredible loving way. Why wouldn't we want to follow in that? You know, I often go to the garden and I say this all the time, right? When you go to the garden prior to the fall and, and the way that God kind of finds them, which is so heartbreaking, God wants to be with them, right? It says he was walking through the garden in the cool of the day. Insert my my nerdy pastor dad joke, which is God wants to chill with his people the hey. cool of the day, right? Like this is what he's trying to do. And we instead, you know, we take it almost the opposite way. And you see that that's a result of sin. But then when you put it into specific places, this is how racism happens. And we're not intentional to say we need to be calling that out. And instead, we try to conflate it with all these other issues. And I think that's a huge part of the problem, too. So, Josh, you're a white guy, white dude from California. What's your why, man? <laughs> I, I, I want to do say two quick things about it. I mean, one, uh, Martin Luther, who, if if you're a part of any you know modern faith tradition uh, in this world, uh, you can you can look to. Even though he wasn't very fond of my uh, Jewish ancestors, uh, that's a different story. We can still take some wisdom from a lot of the things he said. One of them being, uh, uh, you know, we don't do good works. Uh, sorry, God does not need my good works. Uh, my neighbor does. And I, I think that's something to keep in mind, because one of the criticisms we do get is about like, oh, you can't create a utopia. You're trying to fix the world. Nothing's going to be perfect. Perfection. Let's throw it. Yeah. No, let's throw that out the window. But you know what? The mother who is uh, a woman of color who's three to five times more likely to die in childbirth uh, because that's the way it works in America. Um she's going to appreciate it if we do something and help her uh, so that she can uh, be safer when she's having a baby. Uh, so those are the things I, I feel like to think about on a personal level. And obviously this isn't the priority, but I would say for anybody who's thinking about like digging into racial justice or exploring their own heritage uh, for me, I'm going to try to not get emotional. <laughs> um, like my life, I'm a completely different person um, than who Even I was. Before. Uh I, I've never felt more like myself um, because shaking off the, I, sorry, man. <laughs> you're good, bro. <clears throat> I think, I think uh, I understand where you're going. It's like the more you look into it, the more I, for me personally, the first 30 years of my life, uh, my eyes were cloudy. And, and yeah. the last seven, eight years, the more I enter into it, I, I, I just, I, there's empathy that, I have for people that don't have what I have and whether that's skin color or gender or gosh, even the grace of God, like, let's, let's get real. Like we all have that. And, and those that don't have it, like my heart yearns for them. So keep going. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's the whole, you know, it's easy to say like, Oh, our identity is in Christ. But if you really, if you really believe that, that means you can, you can, you can shake off whatever, culture is giving you whatever the world's giving you. And for me, that was trying to be, uh, and this is part of my family history too. Part of the reason I'm in the Lutheran church is because, you know, my parents wanted a good, good family. And this is part of the way to do that. And, and they did it and good on them. But, um, you know, for me, that's meant relearning like who I am without, you know, some of the superficial cultural stuff, uh, you know, that I've tried to attain. And anyways, I'm not saying that's the priority. Help your neighbor. That's what it's all about. But um, I, I, I do think there's there. It's also what God has in store for you too. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Uh, helping your neighbor, being there is what Christ calls us. I heard you guys talk about new creation, that kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We have that picture of new creation that Matt you referenced of every tribe, every tongue, and and like I feel like the best we can do in this world is give a glimpse of who Jesus is and what heaven is going to be like. And when we're segregated in our own little circles, we may have some great moments and we can still experience God, but it's not, it's not, it's not what new creation is when we're all together under, uh, you know, the light who is Christ. And, and so uh, that's, that's my, that's my why is like, 
I just feel like as much as we can do to give glimpses in this world of what it will one day be like. And, and right now it's a, a flawed or imperfect in many places. I'm not saying there aren't some beautiful expressions where that happens. So uh, one more question for you guys. What, and if each of you want to take it, that's fine. If, if someone, for whatever reason, their heart's yearning for this. They want to. They want to learn more. Get involved with racial justice or racial reconciliation. What What would you say are a, is a good next step for them? This is always a super difficult question to ask because we have no reference for where the student where the student currently is. <laughs> um, but for me, one of the things is I, I would say if the person is one who's really ready to be bold about it is to think of an assumption that they have and dig into it just to see if it's true or if it's something that could have more context added. I think first that has to happen with um, inanimate objects or uh, material. I think that's really important. I think people often try to have, jump to the conversation with the closest Black or Asian or Latina friend they have near them to ask them all the questions. And maybe what would help first is to have that wrestling time with with text and with um, the things that are valued to the people that you're seeking to learn more about, uh, like movies, books, podcasts, music, those sort of things are really easy. Then from there, there might be some additional um, like bridges to cross. And I think that's when you start to involve other people. And I think a safe place to start is with people in, in the church, um, just because you already have something else in common. And it's really hard to pretend to have something in common on a sensitive issue when it comes to um, racial reconciliation. That's good. Reading While Black, a book by Isam McCulley. It'll uh, teach you why it's important to read the Bible in community with people who aren't like you. Uh, the Color of Compromise by Jamar Tisby. It'll give you a history of uh, the American church and how it connects with uh, uh, history and is it interacted. Definitely get into it. Uh, and I'm just supporting Janine's answer of, <laughs> of seeking out resources here. Uh, uh, I Am Not Your Negro. It's a documentary about James Baldwin's perspective on the three major assassinations that happened during the civil rights era. Um, it will change your life. Please check that out. It's really challenging. Um, those are some resources, but because we're on a podcast about discipleship, I'd say challenge yourself on what you think discipleship is and what you think being a disciple means. Are we talking about uh, making other people uh, into your image? <laughs> Are we talking about controlling people? Um, uh, what's your idea of Jesus? Where's that coming from? Um, and 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 I really think challenging some of those ideas um, because you know there's a lot of uh, inherited ideas that that we have that uh, by interacting with people who aren't like us can maybe open up. Uh, our, our minds, but also get us closer to closer to Jesus. I, so I'll say a couple things too. Um, another resource. I don't. I don't want to mess up the title. So, uh, Urban Apologetics by Dr. Eric Mason is fantastic. But, but not just resources. I'll say you got to do two things. One, um, especially as Christians, you got to stay in your word, right? Like stay in God's word as a part of this. Like that's that's right. A starting resource. I think sometimes we act like we have all the other resources but then we stay we don't dig in as much as we need to and i think it's a both end it has to be um and that's not to say so start with god's word that's the only fix actually no no start with god's word because you should be doing that as a christian anyway and because you're doing that then here are all these great resources that we need to be reading the other thing i'll say about this and i think this is less about resource and more about posture um you have to uh, truly, truly take a posture of humility. And when I say that, I mean, when it comes to this issue, especially if you're starting, your starting point should be convincing yourself, not just assuming, because assumption is the lowest form of knowledge, right? But a convincing yourself that you know nothing about this. Like that has to be the starting point for, for a new person. Um, and I'll say it this way, especially a person who is not a person of color, right? Person of color, you have the experience, right? Like you, you've you lived it, so it's coming from a different place. Some, you're right. Actually, Janine's right. Some people do. Um, 
uh, and if you feel like you don't and you're a person of color, great. Start with believing you know nothing about this. Like, really. And what I mean by that is because then your first in, your, your first kind of reading and studying and understanding is not going to be tainted by, oh, well, I know this or I know that or I already knew this. Like coming with all the other knowledge, but saying you want to actually approach this humbly is problematic. And so I think it has to be that posture and, and that mindset. Go ahead, Josh. And, and I think I think Zach will attest to this maybe, uh, but I can definitely say it as a white guy. If you're engaged in this, you're going to wake up every day feeling the way that Matt just described. Uh, you're going to wake up every day going, I know nothing about this. And I, and I made a mistake six months ago when I thought I knew something about this. And that's that's fine. Like the humility is a big part of the recipe here. Yeah, it's good. And, and I, I agree. <laughs> the more I get into it, the more I'm like, ah, I don't know uh, as much as I, I want to. And yet uh, I still feel like God's put something inside of me to steward conversations, to have a voice and to be someone who, who helps bridge this. And so that's where uh, I think a healthy fear is in me is the more I step out into this, uh, I realize I, who am I? But at the same time, God equips us and God uses us. And if I say things the wrong way, God will redeem it and it's all going to be good. So I'm super grateful for you. I end with the last, the same question for all our guests, but we kind of just answered it. It's to challenge our listeners to do one thing. And so I'm going to let the last um, answer kind of be that for those people. I heard a lot of like, obviously diving into God's word. We heard a lot of like resources and things like that, and then coming with a posture of humility. And so uh, thank you guys so much for the conversation today. Uh, it was amazing, insightful. I hope it's not our last one. And so if people want to find out more about Lutherans for uh, Racial Justice, where can they go? Definitely check out lutheransforracialjustice.com. And I know we talked about, you know, a lot of like uh, maybe negative or challenging things today. Uh, the exciting thing about Lutherans for Racial Justice isn't actually the negative stuff. It's this community that's emerged out of it. And it's incredible. We're doing a study now that's going to go on for the next nine weeks uh, about the color of compromise. And, and it, to get together with, you know, we're going to be getting together with like 60 people uh, and meeting new people and talking together and being in community to have that support from all over the country. Uh, it's another encouragement uh, to get into this. Amazing. Yeah, the other thing. Yep, go ahead. Well, no, no, I was just going to say, you know, the other thing is we have, um, you know, if you go on our website, you can sign up for our newsletter so that you can kind of, kind of have a little bit more direct contact. But the other thing is we're always open to, um, you know, you can just email our, our the email on the website and we try to answer. I mean, I'm, I won't say we're always quick. We got a lot of stuff going on, but we, we do answer and we do do our best to connect with people and, 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 you know, assist where we can. Um, and I'll say this, you know, maybe a little bit of a shameless plug, but I'm okay with it. Um, you know, for us, part of the way that, that when we talk about, you know, resourcing or, or, you know, reaching out, but also doing one thing is as you engage in different things, you know, um, recognize where you see people who, uh, you feel like are trusted voices doing the work and then reach out to them too, to learn about different ways to engage, like, like you're doing here, Zach, which we are so thankful for. Um, because, you know, like we look at like Janine and I, we're on the front lines. We're, we're you know, uh, at congregations in New York City and then running a school in New York City where, I mean, it's like 99 percent uh, people of color and students of color, families of color. And so, you know, we're at Our Savior in the Bronx and, and working our tails off in a different way, but engage in that work. I know Josh does a lot with where he is and and uh, his wife, Sarah, does a bunch. So, I mean, you know, being on the front lines is key. And, and then if you're not, figure out ways that you can connect. Go ahead, Janine. Good. I, I have two things, um, just as far as like ways to reach out. I think that um, the first one, obviously, it's, it's kind of a shameless plug for the podcast. But with the question that we were centering around earlier on the Impartial Church podcast, we go into it um, for about six of the 10 episodes of the next season. So um, if, if you've come to a place of some sort of complacency within the faith, like that's what we're going to be delving into. Um, and then second, um, at, at Our Savior in the Bronx, um, we're hosting a trip. Um, so if you are a college student or a college age student um, interested in education in any way, shape or form, May 14th to 17th, um, it's a partnership with a couple of our different um, universities, Lutheran universities around the country, but it's an urban immersion trip. So um, things like that often serve as opportunities to 
for exposure, for connection, um, for challenging assumptions, and then for kind of solidifying that calling if that's something else that you're looking to go into. Awesome. I just real, real quick, Zach, I just want to double down on Janine's shameless plug. If they love, if you love this podcast, you'll love Impartial Church. It's so good. Cool. They're great. So. And we'll put all the links to all that in the show notes so people listening can. And I hope that I hope you do that. I hope I hope you take these resources, these links, these podcasts, and at a minimum dive into this more. And so I can't thank the three of you enough for obviously the conversation today, but but uh, to be busy in the front lines doing what you do. And still to recognize and realize there's a greater need and let's come together to really help with this. Thank you so much for doing what you do and anything I can do, we can do to help like we're in your corner. God bless you. And uh, thank you so much for the conversation today. Thanks so much. Thanks, Zach. We appreciate you. Thank you for, thank you for doing this. Thanks for, uh, yeah. for having us on. Cool. What a great conversation we had today. And I hope that, I hope you do one thing at least with today's conversation, that, that you take a step in the right direction when it comes to fighting against racism. So, so thank you, Matt, Janine, Josh. We shared a ton of resources in today's episode. And so go to redletterpodcast.com. We've got show notes, the highlights of, of today's show, as well as all the links that they provided for us. You're gonna find all of those there. You'll, you'll see... Uh, from our sponsor today, Red Letter Living, how you can take the free Red Letter Challenge Assessment, seven to 10 minutes, 40 questions, but it's gonna help you discover where you are today as a disciple of Jesus. So season three was amazing. It's been my favorite season so far. We've had some incredible conversations. And here's the good news. Season four is coming. We're gonna take a few weeks off, but we'll be back in May. That is right. We'll be back in May with a brand new season with world-class leaders, world-class disciples, helping you, challenge you to be a greater disciple. But until then, I've got an incredible opportunity for you. So what is it? You have a chance to own a piece of history. What am I talking about? All right. Anyone who rates and reviews our podcast, now I'm going all the way back from the beginning to until we record season four in May, here's what's going to happen. You are going to be entered into a drawing to win. Look at this. If you're watching on YouTube, you're seeing this. If not, I'll describe it. To win the red sequins jacket of Chris Johnson. That's right. We are retiring this jacket in season four. Chris is coming back probably in a new red jacket and we will choose one lucky are you lucky if you win this? I don't know. I'm not washing it. So it's going to have all the sweat from Chris, which is nasty. But if you enjoyed the podcast, if it's helpful, we would love for you to rate and review. And we will send this to one lucky winner. We're going to draw this drawing, uh, draw this jacket for a winner as we record season four coming in May. Until then, thank you so much for being a part of the Red Letter Disciple podcast. Share it with a friend. Subscribe and follow on your favorite platform. That way you don't miss it. And we'll see you back for season four in just a few weeks. God bless you.